<laughs> That's funny. Okay, um, I think we're ready to get started. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our live seminar series. My name is Olivia Lanes from IBM Quantum, and today I am hosting Zlatko Minev, also from IBM Quantum, for today's very special seminar. Zlatko is going to be talking to us about quantum hardware design, energy, circuits, and metal. Um, so we are thrilled to roll out this latest episode of the series. It is dedicated to the research and academic quantum communities. It takes place every Friday, Eastern time at noon on the Kiskit YouTube channel. All right, so welcome Zlatko. I'm going to introduce you um, briefly and then we can go ahead and get started. I think most people already know Zlatko, but I'll, I'll give a, a short little introduction. Um, so Zlatko Minev is a research staff member at IBM Quantum, as I said. He is the project and technical lead of the IBM Quantum Device and Design and Analysis Project, which is Kiskit and Metal. Uh, Zlatko received his BA from UC Berkeley with distinction and high honors under Irfan Siddiqui. He then went on to get his PhD with distinction at Yale University in the field of superconducting quantum physics under Michelle Dever. Recently, MIT Technology Review named Slatko one of their 35 innovators under 35. He also serves as a member of the executive board of the Yale Graduate Alumni Association. And a few years ago in 2012, Slack co founded a nationwide science outreach and career pathways organization called Open Labs, which opens pathways for underrepresented and underprivileged young scholars to pursue careers in the sciences. Uh, Slack co's work has been featured in mainstream media worldwide. He has over 100 news publications, national TV, and radio interviews, including NPR. So, Zlatko, uh, my friend and colleague, welcome. And how are you doing today? Olivia, thank you for that uh, very nice and long and embarrassing introduction. And it's my pleasure to be here. I think this is my first time on the other side of, of this chair, so to speak, of this table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, slightly different, but you know the drill, so I don't actually have to introduce the, uh, the format or anything. So it saves us a little bit of time there. Um, but as a reminder to the audience, Zlatko is going to present and show us his slides, but feel free to ask questions throughout, and I'll do my best to uh, politely interrupt him and possibly ask some of my own questions. And then if we have time, we can have more of a discussion Q&A at the end as well. Wonderful. Polite or not, I love, I love discussion, so uh, happy to get to it. All right. Uh, I'll let you take it away. All right. Thank you, Olivia, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Um, we have uh, a, a bit of a special seminar. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting them, but seeing as I'm one of the organizers, so I'll admit that this was a bit of a last minute call for me to uh, fill in for a spot. But nonetheless, I'm very excited to share with you some recent results on designing quantum hardware in two different capacities. One in the capacity, I think, of a community to really fuel the fire in the furnace of innovation, just in, in the open source, open quantum hardware design capacity and in the other capacity on the more deep research side of how do we actually develop and improve the methods that can help us design the best possible quantum devices moving forward and to answer to those questions i thought i'd begin with the larger picture and try to get everybody more or less on the same page starting from what most of you probably are familiar here which is some notion of what is now the quantum cloud where you can dream up your circuits of Hadamards, ST gates, unitaries, and in principle, you can execute them and get your ideal oh, or perfect or maybe NISC answer. But whenever I see this, I'm also reminded by this quote, of this quote by Asher Perez that quantum phenomena do not occur in, in a Hilbert space, despite our best efforts. They occur in the laboratory. And so today we're going to reveal what's behind the cloud in a sense, what drives its power and capacity and also how we can drive that forward and so let's dive into something near dear and familiar to all of you here and that's of course your laptop which you're probably tuning in from today it's also the same place where you can now log into a lab or cloud facility in order to execute quantum programs and in that facility is a cryogenic environment that itself houses the beating heart or the beating brain of the quantum computer. Here you see a dilution refrigerator or the golden chandelier as we like to refer to it, which itself only at the very bottom of it houses the real brain, uh, the quantum processor, the quantum device chip. Really the only quantum part about this whole picture is the quantum chip. So then the question is how do we understand the physics of these quantum devices and how do we make the next generation? 
which is the cornerstone of the entire ecosystem of quantum software and the rest. And what this talk is about is really this, I think, beautiful connection between this very classical picture on the left of a chip with wires and metal and dielectrics and so forth, somehow bridging this gap from this classical world into the world of Hamiltonians, wave functions, uh, networks of qubits that are coupled together that you can control with precision at 10 to the minus 4 and beyond. And what's the story of today is, one, how do we make this bridge from the classical to the quantum and back so we can iterate in a feedback loop? And moreover, how do we make this increasingly more precise and more applicable to a broader array and class of quantum novel devices? And if you ask me coming in this from some time ago, I overall think it's a miracle that we can at all try to engineer these systems at the level of you know, 10 to the minus four and, or six and beyond. And we keep pushing this because these are macroscopic, large quantum objects on the left that you see here that we can now shape, manipulate and engineer and create our own custom tailored artificial atoms, which we then tailor into a fabric that builds a whole quantum processor. And so this is the story of that. In the rest of the talk, we'll start with the overview of the design process of your own quantum chip, if you'd like, which will then lead us into the quick solution. At this stage, you don't have to really labor to recreate all of the tools uh, that yours truly had to do at one point. But nowadays, I'd like to introduce you to what we've just launched somewhat recently, Kiskit Metal. It's an open source framework that allows you to design your own quantum chip and builds in the best practices and also the open source uh, culture ethos, as well as uh, some of the techniques that I'll mention in the rest of this talk, kind of cutting edge, very recent work on quantization techniques, the techniques that allow you to really understand how new qubits, uh, new couplers, new structures behave and operate in principle, no matter what they are. Or in the second half of this, talking about how you can now modularize this, moving from a more black box, generally applicable approach, uh, like the energy participation ratio, to an approach that focuses more on speed and modularity, which is a more recent work that uh, we just published quite recently, called Circuit Quantum Electrodynamics with Quasi-Lump Models. And so I'll begin with the design, but as any good talk, I thought I would first begin by acknowledging the growing and amazing team of folks who have contributed to the first part of this talk and, and beyond uh, of uh, the Kiskit Metal team and, and cohort and folks, uh, also your host here, truly yours truly as well. And uh, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge all the wonderful work that they've done, which you'll see permeated through many of the rest of these slides. Returning to the picture of going from your near, dear and familiar quantum laptop all the way to the beating heart of the quantum processor, the quantum device chip, let's try to zoom in into what one of these chips tends to represent nowadays. So if you log into one of these online services, if you'd like, you can see uh, a network diagram of uh, a coupled qubits that looks something like this where you see circles, each circle represents a qubit. That qubit is implemented as what we like to refer to as an artificial atom. And then those qubits are interconnected by these blue lines, whatever they are. So this is at the level of a high abstraction. And what we're going to do is really dive to the bottom layer and under take that abstraction away and really understand and optimize this in depth. And so here's the process of how we actually do this. Let's start with the physical layout of part of the quantum chip. Here I've depicted a transmon qubit, which has metal pads, two metal pads connected by a nonlinear element called the Josephson tunnel junction. And you can see charges can move or slosh back and forth, much like the microwave oven in your kitchen, if you want to some degree. This looks very much like a classical picture you might see in a classical chip, except that its features are a bit strange and different to the classical world and you don't typically see those that exact same pattern but to first order you can analyze and understand this superconducting quantum circuit as just an electromagnetic oscillator 
your harmonic or slightly anharmonic oscillator that uh, has capacitance and inductance and oscillates. And this is usually the first tack of approach uh, to attack and analyze a quantum devices to begin to treat it in a classical or semi-classical way where you try to understand and leverage the tools that already exist for maybe the classical manufacturing and chip industry and microwave techniques to understand how the electromagnetics of this chip oscillate. But then comes the departure, because you can only get so far by doing this, I think. What comes next is really the bridge from the classical analysis where you have pieces of metal on a chip and you have electromagnetic oscillators. You then have to somehow take the bridge from that world into the world of a quantum Hamiltonian, the world where we actually describe the quantum electrodynamical behavior of the circuits. And once you have that Hamiltonian, you then, you then also need to understand that Hamiltonian, break it down into its pieces, and understand how you can now create qubits, couplings, interactions, C naught gates, unitaries, etc., out of it. And as you can see, there are several steps in this process spanning traditionally disparate worlds, the world of conventional CMOS EDA, the world of microwave electromagnetic engineering, uh, the world of Hamiltonian engineering, and so forth. And in the endeavor to create a quantum chip, you have to iteratively go through this process over and over again, going from the physical layout, checking the electromagnetics, the Hamiltonian, understanding what the actual final qubit properties are, and usually iterating until you find a desired target uh, set of properties that you're looking for. And that's the challenge that uh, our field is faced with, is to really understand and tailor this at increasingly precise levels as we push quantum processors, I think, into the next and next generation. And I think at the heart of this, is this bridge between the classical world on the one hand, where we have pieces of metals and dielectrics, which on their own we're quite familiar with, and on the other world, where we have the world of the quantum, Schrodinger cats and things can be in two places at the same time and so forth. And now the goal for us is really to connect the two very tightly so we can bridge this classical to quantum boundary and allow ourselves to iterate in a, in a feedback loop to really look for the best devices to optimize and produce uh, new structures as well. One parable is to start to do quantum, you can start with classical. And that's very much the spirit of this analysis. The rest of the talk will really focus on this bridge. On one, how we can make that bridge easy, and two, how can we actually come up with the right approaches to make that bridge uh, as accurate and modular as possible? Now, if you're just joining us and you're quite new to this field but are interested, I can offer you one potential avenue to your journey in this uh, world, and that's a set of summer school lectures uh, by Kiskit that we gave last year. And this will really be a nice uh, entryway into what the rest of the talk will focus on. So you can take a look. There's a number of videos and lecture notes and labs uh, that complement the actual video lectures, and they're all on YouTube. One thing that I think we constantly see is that there isn't one technique to rule them all in this world of uh, quantum device design. When we want to bridge, say, this or a five qubit chip depicted here on the left and understand its total Hamiltonian so we can understand how it actually will behave and we can tailor that. There's different descriptions that we tend to use. And the two methods I'll present use two different descriptions. And it's not to say that one is necessarily better than the other, it's rather that they that each serves a purpose and is better tailored to a different part in the analysis. So for instance, one of the constructions you'll often see is that the total Hamiltonian of all the coupled systems can be decomposed into a system Hamiltonian plus a set of interactions that only connect disparate systems. And this is one of the approaches that uh, some of these descriptions take. The second one, which is one we'll focus on quite a bit as well, is to instead break up the Hamiltonian in a different way by breaking it up into a purely linear plus a purely nonlinear place, uh, um, 
part, excuse me. And the nonlinear part will give rise to many and all of the interactions, but it will also address each system and define it in its own way. Uh, this is at the more abstract level, but the way that you can actually make this bridge in practice has a number of paths you can take. And to give a very crude picture of the landscape here, there's really methods of increasing gradations of complexity, starting at the very simplest, perhaps best well-known and oldest method, where one can try to come up and cook up a model of what their quantum device looks like, a uh, type of circuit diagram. <clears throat> this is something that can be fast, but it's in a sense lacking a lot of the information of what's actually happening with the materials and physics of the device and is an, approximate, is an approximation, which you can then increasingly um, reduce or relax. So more recently, there is a series of methods that I might call quasi-lump methods that integrates these kinds of distributed structures that are continuous with some of these discrete lumped circuit elements. And if you really want to understand as much detail as possible about what's going on at the level of the quantum processor, I think you have to go to full wave approaches where you really tackle the full glory and, and complexity of Maxwell's equations. And I can broadly separate them into two broad categories, those based on the impedance or a driven response and those based on the energy or the eigenmode approach. And part of our goal here is to advance the science and technology of these different approaches. So today I'll talk about the energy participation approach, which I think captures the most complexity. But the thing with these full wave approaches is that with complexity comes also cost. And the cost is that they're a bit more computationally expensive. So quite often we want a more modular quasi lump method. And that's perhaps what we'll get to also in this talk if we have time uh, on the more recent paper here as well. And coming back to the picture of the chip, when we apply these methods, it's not like there's only one constraint or two constraints that you can tune independently. What makes this quite a bit of an interesting challenge is that there's quite a few things that you have to keep in mind when you want to design your own quantum device processor. Well, first you have the constituent elements of a quantum chip, including structures such as readout resonators, the squiggly coplanar waveguide here, dielectrics, metals, junctions, geometries, and topology qubits. But you also have to design their frequencies and harmonicities, the qubit-qubit coupling, input-output coupling, uh, ideally spurious qubit couplings, unwanted uh, interactions, modes of the sample holder, radiation dissipation, loss budget, losses, uh, dissipation, and so forth. And many of these constraints are conflicting and at odds with each other, and they also don't tune independently. So this is why we'd like to place quite a bit of emphasis on trying to make this process as easy as possible so that we can free up the hands of the designer to be as creative and, and quick as he or she can. And so that brings me to now giving you a solution to how you can tackle all these questions. And in principle, one that's that you can just pip install. Um, so with this, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how to design your own quantum chip. And this is an open source initiative that we've launched uh, here from IBM Quantum not so long ago. I think I started this project two and a half years ago, but we've only launched it quite recently. And I, I was quite happy to to uh, to see one response to this project, which proclaim that you don't have to be a rocket or a quantum scientist to design a quantum chip using this new tool called Qiskit Metal. So what is Qiskit Metal? Well, Qiskit Metal is an open software package, part of Qiskit, that completes the Qiskit stack that tries to bridge this gap from the physical chip structures all the way to your quantum Hamiltonian, to how you would design your gates and your qubits and their properties, and tries to automate almost every aspect and method as much as it can to bridge this world of traditional layout and engineering to the world of the analysis and the simulations that you have to do. And to close this feedback loop so we can really optimize on it. If I give you a slightly less abstract version of this quantum chip design flow, one might start with the concept, which gives you a Hamiltonian that you'd like to implement. That Hamiltonian you have to then 
somehow turn into a layout of an actual device that goes to a fabrication facility that's made into a physical structure. And to do that, you have to iterate in this loop going between um, layout to electromagnetic analysis to quantum analysis back and forth. And some of these steps are expensive computationally, time consuming, also laborious. Um, and I think Olivia can probably attest to having spent a lot of her PhD life uh, I was actually just cycles. about to ask you, Zlako, if you could comment on like just how time consuming it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Olivia. Can really appreciate the, the, the pain point here. Um, so, for example, for the quantum jump paper um, that I did, I spent, I think, you know, two or three months just designing a two qubit device and going back and forth. And it turned out eventually that the design I was trying to implement was physically impossible to to realize altogether um, and the energy participation ratio is one way to see why it's actually physically impossible you can get quite close but you can't quite perfectly get it so it uh, took you three months of design before you realized it was physically impossible is that what you're what you're saying um yeah i think it took three months to settle on a final design and yeah. you know then you measure it and then you tweak things um and part of that is because it was a new design um, it, we needed to realize a new kind of energy level diagram that, that we hadn't done before. And the simulations take time. The code wasn't there. We had to write the code to run all this. Right. Um, and, and during that time, you know, I, I couldn't converge on the parameters of the qubits I wanted. And I was also working on the energy participation. I was developing energy participation ratio. And eventually, yeah, it, it, it helps uh, help me help push me in a direction where, you know, I showed that there's some constraints that mean that you know, what I was trying to implement, you can't really do. <laughs> yeah, I actually, so I was thinking when I was looking at this slide as just a small side point, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I don't even know if this direct arrow that you have from this setup where you're doing the layout, the analysis directly to fabrication is 100% accurate because I made so many chips that I measured, then realized that there was something wrong with them and then had to go basically back to step two on here. So it really, uh, you know, wastes even more time than you might naively think. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, when I said three months, that was the first iteration. Yeah, uh, sure. I had the same experience. And that's why I think it's so important to be able to rapidly prototype these. Or, you know, like you said, it, it takes a long time to make the chip. And then if you get it wrong, it can cost a lot of time and money and, and, and human experience to go back and try to redo this. Um, so hopefully this is all stress tested and, you know, works, works off the bat. <laughs> um, so I can, I can sympathize quite well with you there. Yeah. Sorry for that interruption. Please continue. No, no, this is, this is great. Um, you've set us up for why, uh, out of, out of this, uh, experiences, I thought, okay, there has to be a better way to do this. Right. So we've since then, uh, launched project Kiskit Metal, which tries to automate all of these steps and seamlessly as much as possible interconnect these different worlds of you know, traditional layout, EDA, electromagnetic analysis, quantum analysis in particular, which is really, I think, a lot of the unique new part of this, the best techniques that are also stress tested that we've used in practice that you know as much as possible there aren't bugs in. Uh, to the Hamiltonian and to really try to make this uh, as, as seamless as possible so that you can focus on creating exciting new physics rather than you know going uh, in this loop over and over again. And maybe I can illustrate this by an example. And if you really want to get into it, honestly, the best thing is to just take a look at the website. There's lots of videos and tutorials and, and documentation. So I won't dwell on this too much. I'd like to just give you a flavor. And part of it is that regularity is our greatest ally in chip design. So one of the approaches we've done here is to try to break up the chip into known reusable quantum components that you can then take, such as this transmon qubit here in orange or this coplanar waveguide, input output couplers or entire blocks. So there's a library of devices that are familiar that you can you know, go in and take a look at if you're designing quantum devices or chips, or if you'd like to just design your own brand new one. We'll focus here on this particular example of a single transmon qubit and try to create a four qubit chip out of it. 
And the way that this part works in this uh, day and age is that from the library of quantum components, you import the library of qubits, you then pick your favorite one, which I'll pick a transmon qubit, you can then kick off the Kiskit metal visualization GUI, creating a new design. This is what the GUI looks like. And uh, I guess here in the background, I've run a script that you know quickly generates a four qubit chip where each qubit here is a transmon qubit connected to these coplanar waveguides. These are resonators that then have some coupling structure that will be connected to something else. Let's maybe zoom in though on just one of these transmon qubits. And one of the things is that at the end of the day, the, the qubit has a few properties, you know, such as its frequency and, and its couplings, but they, those can depend quite intimately or intricately on a number of the actual physical parameters of the chip. Um, so just like a good P cell or parameterized cell, you can tailor all these features and options of these components, either from the GUI or from the Python API in the background. And you can really vary and, and you know, do everything you would expect here. Um, but all of these geometries are endowed with further features that allow you to use them in the different simulation methods. And we'll see how translating across that works. The other thing that's quite neat is that uh, we've tried to make the components as smart as possible. So that you can say something like, if I have multiple qubits, take qubit one, pin A, and dynamically connect it to qubit two, uh, pin B or something. Um, and anytime I move one of those qubits, that connection will automatically keep track and reroute. So let me illustrate by uh, more or less stamp and repeating four qubits here with a little Python script in the background. Then saying that I want to connect um, qubits two and qubits three let's say pin A to pin C, that's going to connect them by a fixed coplanar waveguide of a fixed length, excuse me. And this is automatically routed and you can you know, adjust its spacings and so forth. From there, you can build up the rest of the chip using the known building blocks. So reuse as much as possible. And so here we've now created input output lines that can send signals in and out of the structure. And oh, this is a little movie with some sound here, which we can ignore. But here's a movie that will show us how you can also begin to interface or bridge from um, the actual Kiskit Metal software into another simulation tool. In this case, it happens to be ANSYS HFSS, which we use extensively. But in principle, it could be uh, any other simulation tool. And, and we'll see more on this in a second. There's a number of other features, you know, built in automatic collision avoiding routing algorithms and so forth. And, and, you know, I'll let Thomas McConkie and other folks on the team kind of give you the tutorials later uh, on the website, but you can really design your own custom chip here. One that we show with different types of qubits, uh, cross mons connected to transmon pockets with different features. And often we get the question, you know, can you make your own qubit? The answer is yes. Even if you wanted to make a smiley qubit, yes, use a couple of lines of code, we'll get you there. Really, I think where it gets more interesting, though, is not so much in the layout. I think the more interesting stuff for for uh, for us is really in the analysis. And here we've tried to build in really the all the core analysis techniques that use capacitive analysis, where you can try to build out a lumped equivalent model based on capacitances and inductances for your structures, which will then give you the Hamiltonian the kind of more familiar scattering matrix impedance and admittance approaches or a black box quantization, which uh, allow you to really understand the physics of the transmon in at the level of Maxwell's equations and extract very simple parameters. And what I'll have the chance to talk about a little bit more in depth is to also understand the normal modes or the eigenmodes of these structures. Um, and this is kind of the third large class or category of analysis techniques that you can take. And the idea is that as much as possible, all of this we've tried to automate uh, in the software. So you can say, you know, take this part of my chip, let's say this qubit and this coplanar waveguide, render it into some simulation backend, whatever that is. Here it happens to be ANSYS. 
run a simulation on it. So you can see here the electric fields uh, of and the charges, what they would do on the transmon qubit mode, where you have these two transmon pockets. So you see that charges are lighting up around the transmon junction. Or you, instead of the ANSYS HFSS type of high frequency simulation, you can instead do a capacitive simulation in Q3D, more or less at the click of a button, where all of the boundary conditions for perfect electric conductor, the material conditions, what's a, what type of dielectric is what, and so forth, are as much as possible built in automatically, kind of cutting that uh, three months time down. And of course, you can handle and look at more complicated structures as well, rendering, let's say, this two qubit um, kind of hanger resonator type of structure into the simulation here. So this all comes with you know, best practices and, and, and curves that are built in directly rather than importing a GDS. So this we've seen better simulation results on. And you can scale in complexity and so, and so forth. I think this is these slides are just to give you a flavor of what's currently underway and what's possible. Uh, it is a work in progress and it's an early stage source code, but I think you can see it's already done quite a bit. Sparka, we have a few questions. Oh, yeah, please. Now it's a good time to ask. We have some people in the chat asking if there are any other software that is available to use instead of ANSYS for right now, um, and a few others. But yeah, go ahead. I'll let yeah. you answer that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in here, the the main so right now off the bat, you can use the ANSYS one since that's that's what I've happened to that's what I've done most of my work in. So that's that's the code I wrote and that's the code we've we've written since. Um, you it is set up in such a way that you can take that ANSYS code. It's an abstraction and replace it the the render with either sonnet or ads keysight that's one thing we're very actively looking at is is you know working with different renders um so as i mentioned it's an early product it's an early alpha and expanding into more of these things like fast henry for instance which is open source as well we'd love to do that um so i think that's all on the roadmap but it's mostly question of bandwidth um but um, happy to help work with people to make that happen Okay, awesome. Thanks. And then uh, a couple of people, in case you're not paying attention to the chat, we're asking oh, yeah, where, I'm not. <laughs> where they can read more about this. So I just go ahead. I went ahead and posted the the archive paper um, in the chat. So anyone who wants to read about that, uh, the PDF is there. Wonderful. Thanks. Yeah. So for the Kiskid Metal part, kiskid.org um, will take you there. And uh, for the rest of these papers, I have some archive references here and I'll give some more in, in the second half of this. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Olivia. Yeah, no problem. Go ahead. OK, perfect. Yeah, feel free to uh, interrupt me with more questions. Um, here, I'm mostly going to, I think, give a broader picture of what's where we are and what's now possible. Once you have you know rendered and done your microwave analysis, this is kind of like simulating your oven in the kitchen. Uh, you're not you're not done, right? This is just the beginning. This is where quantum begins. And this is, I think, where the core of Kiskit Metal really begins. It's not so much in the layout. It's really in taking these results and then using them to um, understand the quantum parameters, whether it's by technique A, B, C, or D, right? Um, so here are some plots showing these are auto-generated in metal, where you can look at things like the uh, qubit frequency and add harmonicity as a function of your simulation pass number, which is an adaptive thing. So you can make sure that you've really well converged. Uh, you always get an answer from a simulation, but you, how do you know you trust it? Then you can look at things like the cross curve rate between two qubits or a qubit and a readout, linear couplings, and so forth. And I think when you're finished, with your analysis, which here I'm only touching on, you can then export to your GDS format, which is the standard thing you would send to a fabrication facility, and that's quite optimized. So one question that I, I will anticipate is, what are a few use cases of devices made with Kiskit Metal? And I think the first one that's quite fun is, right, somehow we got quite popular in Korea, not sure quite how, but in the early access uh, phase of this, we got invited to participate in this uh, hackathon in Korea. Uh, and to my knowledge, this is the world's first quantum hardware hackathon where we had a project 
uh, where three or four teams of four to five uh, students and postdocs and so forth who were quite new to the field and had never used metal were tasked to design in just 24 hours this uh, two qubit chip from scratch um, you know starting with you know python setup install uh, and to really hit these target parameters of what we want for the qubit frequencies cross curve couplings dissipation rate kappas uh, their bus frequencies and so forth this is uh, the sample notebook and uh, big thanks to to yuri and the kiska team and 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 folks here and these are some pictures of of that hackathon of uh you know i'm pretty proud that these these folks were able to you know from never having used this before to set up a full two qubit chip in just 24 hours in just 24 hours it really impressed me and made me also feel a little bit <laughs> like i might have wasted a little too much time in grad school with those three months designing a two qubit device when you know these these folks could uh, pick it up and do it from scratch in now 24 but also excited that i think we are at a at a place where we can start to do that uh, more recently, we've designed internally this um, device. Uh, it's a five qubit device that's going out to the University of Tokyo. This is the actual device inside the Kiskit Metal GUI. Um, and uh, this has a number of features on it, but uh, I'll say that even more exciting to me was to see that within the short few months of the early access phase, we had uh, Chris Warren and folks from Bylanders Group at Chalmers University uh, recreate and uh, with the help of Kiskit Metal, design their eight qubit quantum processor that looks like this, that has even these circular interesting transmon qubits. And this is an image that I received from Chris simulating one of these devices. That device has since been cooled down um, and measured. Each of these dips here represents one of the qubit uh, qubits being measured, one of the qubit resonators the thing being measured. Uh, and here is also a spectrum of the qubit. We can measure its anchromaticity and extract the Hamiltonian parameters. And from what I gather, they agree quite well with the predictions and simulations that, that we've uh, uh, that that Chris ran here earlier on. So I think with that kind of very rapid introduction to this world of designing quantum devices, in a few use cases. I can try to point you if you're interested in the direction of where do I get started and how do I get started if this is of interest. Um, this is the documentation page. I think if you just Google Kiskit Metal Docs, it will come up. And there's a number of video recordings on YouTube of tutorials, as well as we've tried to do with the team here. And really happy and proud with the folks that uh, we've done really a number of really nice tutorials on all the different analysis techniques and simulation techniques, layout, and so forth. So if you're interested in more depth, I think this is a great resource. And the video tutorials will really take you through all these steps in, in much more detail. And some of them are, I think, quite nicely on the educational side, introducing even some of the more basic concepts. Um, and I think with that, for Kiskit Metal, I can say that the aim here is that this is really a community-driven project. It's one where we want to to work with the community and we want to build and foster community around this. I think it's important for the entire quantum ecosystem that's underpinned by quantum hardware to, to make its innovation as easy as possible so that we can accelerate in that way. And uh, yes, for more information on Kiska Metal, take a look at, at this site. Before we move on too far from use cases, uh, Zlatko, we had somebody asking if there were any other types of qubits besides transmons that you guys have used metal for yet. Yeah, thanks. That's a really good question. Um, so certainly flux tunable transmon, which are very close. There's um, different varieties and shapes of the transmon. So they're all they're all transmons, uh, like the the grounded xmon here, the floating, the concentric transmon, and so on. Um, there's different types of couplers and the flexonium has been kind of the next really popular thing that uh, I think several folks are currently underway yeah. uh, drawing up and using in metal. So I think that's the, that's kind of the next big one to, to look at. <laughs> yeah, I agree. All right, cool. Thank you, Olivia. Great. Um, excellent. So yeah, so if for any more questions, this is, I think a good resource. Um, and that brings me to more of the physics. 
uh, I think hopefully the first part will try to tell you that if you just want to click a button and know how to get the answer, there is a software package now to do that. In the second half, I'd like to rather be, introduce you to more of a new method that I think unifies this design approach on both dissipation and Hamiltonians. For details, you can see the preprint here, which is now accepted, and uh, my dissertation. Coming back to all of these questions that we have to simultaneously answer when designing a quantum device, I'd like to introduce you to the idea that the solution to all of these questions reduces to a simple single one, which is where is the energy? That is, if you know where the energy is, you can answer all of these questions in a unified systematic way. More precisely, you have to ask yourself the question, what fraction of the energy of, of a mode, such as the transmon mode or the resonator mode, denoted by P sub J for junctions and P sub L for lossy elements, is stored in the nonlinear dissipative, sorry, in the nonlinear or dissipative element, such as a Josephson junction or a lossy dielectric? And the answer to this question is a number of an energy participation between zero and one. It's a bounded number, it's just a fraction. The participation on the left can give you the full quantum Hamiltonian if you keep asking this question over and over again for every mode and every junction. The participation on the right can help you build out your entire dissipation budget. And so the same concept of how much of the energy of a mode is stored where can then help you reconstruct your complete picture. Let's focus first on constructing the full Hamiltonian. And I'd like to begin by a little pop quiz, which is what is the Hamiltonian of a linear distributed system? So this is a box. Um, the question is, what is its Hamiltonian? Imagine that there are electromagnetic fields that live inside this box. It could be a, a 1D box, a 2D box, a 3D box. There's a little bit of a delay between when I ask the question and when you can respond. So feel free to type it in the chat and we'll see what we get. But as I think most of you can probably guess, the Hamiltonian of a linear distributed system is h bar omega a dagger a summed over all the modes of the system. Now, we may not know what the modes are, but the form of the Hamiltonian is always the same. It's the frequencies times uh, these creation and annihilation operators. And we can use a classical simulation to find these frequencies quite efficiently. Now, suppose that I asked you the question, what is the Hamiltonian of this distributed system, which I purposefully drew to be really awkward looking and strange? Well, the answer is it's h bar omega a dagger a. It's the same. It doesn't matter what the exact details of it are. Now, what if I gave you the following system, which is even more strange looking? It could be 3D, 2D, flip chip. It doesn't really matter. It could even have embedded lumped elements within the distributed structure as well. As long as it's linear and distributed, it's Hamiltonian is the same. It's h bar omega a dagger a. There's, I can almost hear if I'm in, you know, screaming, it's a dagger a, God damn it. <laughs> so the, the kind of simple, funny uh, point here is that it doesn't matter what your linear system is, it's Hamiltonian is always the same. You don't really have to work very hard to understand that, to get that. Um, it can be very difficult to understand the relationship between the frequencies and the exact geometry, but we can also outsource that to classical simulation software, as, I sh as we sh showed in the Kiskit Metal slides, where you just click a button and then you get the eigenmode frequencies of that structure. Um, and so this then uh, brings us, I think, into the question, well, what about the nonlinear elements in our circuits? For example, this is what a Josephson tunnel junction looks like uh, under an SEM image. And amazingly, it can be represented schematically and it can simply behave as, as this effective nonlinear inductor, which is just defined by the flux between its two terminals, the antiderivative of the voltage. No matter what the exact junction looks like, I mean, it looks quite messy here, but independent of the constituent uh, 
um, you know, atomic molecular structure, you're always going to have a very simple relationship between uh, the energy of that junction and the magnetic flux across its terminals, which is Joe Brangel's some famous uh, cosine relationship. Where on the bottom here, I've shown the reduced magnetic flux across the junction terminals, and this is the total energy of that system. Now, as you know, to first order, we can always find a place in this nonlinear element, and we can break up its energy into a linear plus nonlinear piece, if only momentarily. If you have a more general nonlinear inductive element, such as this snail element depicted here, which in practice looks like this, its potential energy can be quite strange and weird, but you can always find a, a place in its potential where it looks quadratic to first order, where it looks linear. So linear and the energy means that it's the, the shape of the energy is quadratic. It's linear response in the force. Now, this is not an approximation. This is simply a partitioning of the energy into two pieces, and it's only going to be momentary because we're going to use that with our knowledge of what the Hamiltonian of a linear distributed system looks like to combine it with the nonlinear elements in order to recover the full Hamiltonian with no approximations of the total system. So we can always break up any nonlinear dipole into a linear piece plus a bunch of nonlinear pieces, not to make an approximation, but just temporarily. We can then, at the level of the Hamiltonian, which is described in terms of fluxes and charges, we can do a change of basis where we can diagonalize in principle, just the linear part. And the coordinates that diagonalize the linear part are going to be denoted here by the eigen flux and the eigen charge. And then what the energy participation ratio does behind the scenes is that it will do another change of basis from these uh, normal mode coordinates into raising and lowering operators, the A's and A daggers. This is the kind of tricky key. Um, quantum objects that we use at the end of the day. And my statement is that in this process, I've retained the full Hamiltonian, even though I've split it into a linear piece and a nonlinear piece, but I haven't done any approximations. All we've done is a change of basis with respect to the linear piece, because the linear piece is something that we can always understand and always simulate in a classical simulator. And then you can always break down and write down the full Hamiltonian into this form, which has a linear piece plus a nonlinear piece. Coming back all the way to the one of the first slides where we broke up the full Hamiltonian into a linear and nonlinear piece, this is more precisely the construction where you have a series of harmonic modes, which then also bear a nonlinearity. Um, but let me illustrate a little bit more precisely with, with a picture. The total Hamiltonian of any general quantum system you can write down in the following form as a linear piece that looks like this, where m denotes the modes. Omega m is the linear mode frequencies. You can get that out of the simulation. A's are the raising and lowering operators, plus the sum of the junction energies, just the nonlinear part, uh, which if you come back to this picture is, is the uh, gray curve minus the green curve. That's the nonlinear part which is a known function over the number of junctions that go from J1 to the total number junction J of the amount of, of the operator that is the amount of flux across the Jth junction. So this nonlinear part just depends on the junctions and the amount of flux across that junction. So what is that flux? That's really the only unknown parameter that we have because from the simulations we know omega, from the construction of the nonlinear elements we know what the E NL of J is, that's the nonlinear potential, but we don't know the amount of flux. Here I've written it as a lowercase phi to denote that it's reduced by, by that constant phi zero. This flux represents, if you want, the voltage more or less across the two terminals of a qubit or any nonlinear device uh, dipole, such as the snail. Because it's a linear system in one sense, uh, you can always decompose the amount of voltage or the amount of flux across this qubit, uh, across this dipole as a linear sum or a linear combination of 
uh, the voltages due to each mode of the system. And that's what we see here. Uh, we see that the position variable, a, a dagger plus a, of every mode of the system is weighed in the sum that tells you how much the junction flux is going to be displaced. The coefficient here has a very key interpretation as the zero point quantum fluctuations of the phase of junction J due to mode M. And that's one of the principles in quantum physics that even though uh, there may be zero energy, even in the zero energy state, uh, or excuse me, the lowest energy state, there are always fluctuations. Uh, the, the phase, the position of the particle, the momentum of the particle is never zero. On average, it may be zero, but it has standard deviation. And that standard deviation is precisely given by this uh, parameter phi mj. So this is a very quantum property that's purely quantum. And the question is, how do we find it? Because in our construction and search of the Hamiltonian, the only thing we haven't found yet is only this parameter phi mj. For the experts in the audience, I'll notice that this equation is nothing other than the basis change. And when I say basis change, I mean this double basis change that we saw here uh, essentially will track that. To find this parameter, we can rely on the notion of energy, and that will guide us entirely. The zero point quantum fluctuations, or the variance here on the left of the flux uh, across the jth junction due to mode m normalized by h bar Planck's constant is equal to the ratio of two known quantities the linear mode eigenmode frequency divided by the Jolfson junction energy times this parameters between zero and one the energy participation ratio the amount of energy stored in junction j due to mode m which is this number between zero and one and so we see that the bridge from the classical world on the on the right hand side, we have purely classically calculable and defined quantities, you know, linear frequencies, just just some energy and amount of energy fraction. And on the right hand side, we have purely quantum quantities, h bar and, and the zero point quantum fluctuations. And the bridge between the two, the bridge over the barrier here, really is served by this energy participation ratio, which is the only thing you can truly tune in your design process since the mode frequencies are more or less constrained from you know, four to eight gigahertz or some band, the Jolson junction energy, you also can't vary it too much. The only thing that you can vary over orders of magnitude is this participation. It can be 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus eight. And when you engineer your quantum system, this is really the, the core quantum quantity that will drive the physics and performance of your device and define your Hamiltonian. You've noticed that to, if you're a little bit more subtle, one small addition that I should note is that if you want to bridge this world, you notice that on the left-hand side, we have a square. So in principle, if you solve this equation, there's a plus minus sign. So we also need to know whether the two junctions oscillate in phase or out of phase. So there's one more bit of information, which we call the sign SMJ um, that complements the participation. So there is a notion of direction but only a relative direction. The absolute direction of a junction uh, voltage doesn't matter, only the relative orientation between two junctions. Let's illustrate on a qubit cavity example. Uh, so here's the example in this case of a 3D cavity, although it could be a 2D one, containing a transmon uh, chip with a transmon qubit here. Its transition spectrum has a cavity uh, mode at this frequency and a qubit mode at this frequency. The qubit also has an anharmonicity uh, denoted by alpha sub q. The anharmonicity is a nonlinear property that, that really arises from the junction, uh, nonlinearity. And if you write it in terms of the energy participation ratio of the qubit and the cavity, that's this is what the enchromonicity looks like. You can also do the same thing for the dispersive shift between the two modes, which is a nonlinear property that says how much the two modes are coupled. And you'll see that it's just the overlap between the amount of energy stored in the junction due to the qubit and due to the um, uh, cavity. The qubit usually has almost 100% of the participation. It sucks in all that participation so that its enchromonicity alpha up here is maximal because the maximum P you can have here is one. So usually the participation of a qubit is 0 0.98, 0 0.99, uh, 
and the participation of a cavity can be at the level of 1% or smaller. And finally, you can also reconstruct the nonlinear lamp shift and, and other parameters like this. Uh, from there, you can really understand uh, driven systems as well as reconstructing any higher order term in the nonlinearity. So this is my symbols for uh, four wave mixing in a Joseon tunnel junction. Uh, you can also work with systems that have uh, more non-trivial bias conditions that are subjected to external flux or gate voltages um, and so forth. And the details of how to handle this, I'll, I'll leave for the experts and for the for the appendix of the energy participation ratio paper. So I'll refer you there. Instead, I'd like to focus on what I think is um, a really fundamental relationship. And to Olivia, to your earlier question, how did you know or find out that the design you were trying to do is actually impossible. Um, these relationships are what allowed me to understand that you know what I was doing is impossible. Uh, these junctions, these participations, uh, these zero point quantum fluctuations that define your interactions, your qubit properties, they're not independent. They are tied together in a knot. And if you nudge one, another one will nudge. Uh, so this is my little cartoon of a knot. The energy participation ratios are monogamous and universal in the following way. A dipole, such as a junction, a snail, a squid, brings exactly one unit of EPR, of energy participation ratio. That's the right-hand side. That unit has to be distributed across all the modes of the system. Some modes can take zero, some can take a lot, others can take less. Um, but it's monogamous in the sense that if one mode takes more participation, such as the qubit, then necessarily and unavoidably another mode must give up energy participation ratio. It's a conserved quantity in that way. So if you want to increase the coupling between your qubit and your cavity, you may increase the participation of the cavity, but that will decrease the participation of the qubit, which will lower its anchromonicity. Second, a mode accepts at most one unit of energy participation ratios. So this is the flip side. Um, a mode can not take up more than one unit of the energy participation ratios because that means that that inductor stores all of its energy at one point. Um, so you can't have two inductors store all the energy of the mode. Uh, that would be, each one would have a participation of 0.5 then. And the third relation, the final one, is that a dipole's energy participation ratios are also orthogonal in a sense. Uh, this is where the signs come in, and uh, I'll leave it for the experts to think about it, but this is a statement that in, they did do have a sense of orthogonality. And of course, there are numbers between zero and one, so that, that gives you restrictions on all these as well. So what these tell us in words is that the quantum fluctuations that determine how strong your couplings and nonlinearities are, are not independent, they are constrained, uh, they're, they're codependent, and they're also constrained in how large and how small they can be based on these participations. That leads to certain design restrictions, and that's, that's how um, you can find whether or not your design makes sense. The other question that one wants to answer in these kinds of analysis techniques is about dissipation. I may come up with a great design that looks like an amazing qubit, um, but how well will it actually perform in subject to losses? And those can often be conflicting demands. Um, I couldn't help myself, but also share some recent news from our team here at IBM Quantum that Jay Gambetta shared uh, that uh, the transmon has, in my view, very miraculously sort of made it even past the one millisecond um, lifetime in the sense that I would not have predicted this a few years ago. I, I, I think this is a wonderful result. And part of the way that progress in the community has been driven to these increasingly larger and larger lifetimes is by understanding the energy participation ratios of the lossy interfaces and dielectrics and materials 
in the design and optimizing against them. That's why the transmon qubits have become larger and larger in features sometimes or have taken uh, strange and funny shapes. Uh, now, I have a picture here of Luigi Frunzio because we, we gave talks back to back. So uh, you get to see uh, a picture of Luigi here. <laughs> Um, the energy, and he was talking about participations, the energy participation ratios, and I won't go into the detail of the math here, but essentially anything you put in a chip, such as uh, bulk or surface dielectric, uh, can bring capacitive loss if you or inductive loss, and interfaces between your structure and the outside world can bring radiative losses, such as Purcell losses, or if you have input-output couplers. Uh, but it's the same unifying idea of asking the question, how much of the energy of a mode is stored in my lossy capacitor, in my lossy surface, my lossy inductor, and so on. It's that participation that then dictates how much impact on your coherence properties <clears throat> this element will have. So it's building out this dissipation budget based on the material properties and, <clears throat> excuse me, these um, energy participations. So to kind of summarize and give you the overview of how we look at and think about the energy participation ratio approach, we start with a classical model, such as the one I showed you in Kiskit Metal. It could be a planar or a 3D structure. Here I've depicted a 3D one. In principle, you can put in a general Josephson nonlinear device, such as a snail or a squid or a junction. The first step is to start with the classical is to linearize the system and do a finite element linearized eigenmode analysis, which gives you the eigenfields and the eigenfrequencies. Omega m are the frequencies, the eigenfields are em and hm, the electric and magnetic fields respectively. From those fields, you can calculate the um, energy participation ratios, the participation of mode m in junction j. So here there are going to be three junctions on these three chips and uh, you can find out how much energy they take up. There are the signs that will tell you how much, um, whether two junctions are in phase or out of phase. There are only two options. And also you can calculate the energy participation ratios of lossy materials, which is a well-known, you know, long, long used technique to build up a dissipation budget so that you can from there construct the full Hamiltonian of the mode frequencies and the dissipation parameters including in principle without any approximation the full nonlinear potential of the hamiltonian and i can happily argue with you about that then what you have to do of course is go back to the iterative process because you'll never quite get it right the first time so you have to iterate and what i can also note is that um normally what we did in the past was to use the eigenmode approach to look at the eigenmodes first find out where the modes are, then do driven impedance simulations, do uh, Simon Nick's 2012 black box quantization. Very nice work to look at the impedances and extract some of these zero point quantum fluctuations and construct the full Hamiltonian. Now we've kind of obviated the need to do that since you actually all the information you need is contained in these eigenmode uh, simulations to begin with. So we've cut down uh, on the number of simulations you might have to do. To summarize the energy participation ratio approach features, it describes any order strength on the arity in principle for composite and nonlinear devices because it's based on this very nice first principle derivation. The only, uh, it has in principle zero approximations uh, in its construction and is fully automated. So in, this is more or less the click of a button in Kiskit Metal and in PyPR. So that's all nice. What are the limits? Well, the practical limits are that while it's in principle without approximations, in practice, you always have to, your computer has a finite RAM and a finite size. So you might have to, you will have to truncate how many modes maybe you simulate or how many FOC levels you include if you do a numerical diagonalization of this Hamiltonian. But that's mostly a limitation of compute power. And then in my final section here, we can answer how well does this actually do in the real world versus experiment. So here's theory versus experiment um, on 3D and 2.5D devices and also waveguide devices. We measured nine different samples with com comprising you know, several qubits each and several modes. Uh, we extracted then the measured 
energies of the frequencies and harmonicities, uh, large qubit-qubit couplings, uh, qubit resonator couplings, and very small qubit-qubit couplings, and compare them against the predicted energy participation ratio uh, results. Then we found that at high energies, the frequencies agreed at the order of a few percent, uh, sorry, at the order of a percent or better. The anharmonicities agreed at the level of 5% or better. Um, and then small dispersive shifts, you could get due to 10% or potentially even better if you include uh, the junction capacitance as well. So that's really, to me, quite was quite striking to begin with because you have five orders of magnitude you're spanning here simultaneously in the same device. You know, this, the, the, some of the points here are in the same device here and they're all predicted simultaneously. And so that's really, uh, I think, one of the amazing parts of the design of these macroscopic quantum devices. You can get this, you know, percent level precision over such large scales in energy. More recently, we used uh, the energy participation ratio and uh, tested it on different, uh, against different methods in this uh, recent paper with some of my colleagues here at IBM, um, which we used the automation in Kiskit Metal for. Um, here's the agreement of measured versus predicted dispersive shifts. This is the most sensitive parameter on this particular device between a qubit and a readout. This is some large scale quantum processors with many qubits. Here I'm showing you 10 qubits using a lumped approximation model. Uh, initially, we found a 20% agreement with the energy participation ratio method. We found the 4% agreement between measured and predicted results. And just for comparison, I'll show you that with the impedance driven approach, we found about a 7% agreement between theory and experiment. Although I'll note that the uh, in recent paper we um, I won't get to today that I've mentioned improves this from 19% all the way down to 10%. Uh, and I think that might be the limit of the approximation of lump structures versus Maxwell's equations for our device. So to summarize the kind of landscape of these main approaches, with the eigenmode approach, we found an agreement of about 4%. The other, the impedance, very similar agreement at the 7% level. The quasi-static initially didn't perform as well, but when you take into account all the subtleties um, in, in how to do that, you can improve it down to about 10%, and that's in this archive paper. Of course, these full-wave simulations give you more complexity to tell you more about uh, the circuit and the fields, but they do cost more. And so this is the faster method. And I would probably say that the energy participation ratio has the highest generality since it allows you to look at the mode structures and also discuss the dissipation of the different components quite, quite in depth. I think with that, we won't get to today uh, the quasi-lump method. Maybe we'll do that sometime in the future. That improves this agreement from by, by this factor of two. Uh, that will soon be rolled out in the Kiskit metal as well. Um, but I think with that, maybe I'll conclude by, again, emphasizing that I think it's important to continue to accelerate uh, the pace of innovation of quantum hardware since the entire quantum ecosystem rests on it. And I'm happy that you know, we're doing this in a very open source way. Uh, we're hoping to work with folks and on uh, you know, Kiskit Metal and these methods and building out new interesting structures uh, to drive the next generation of quantum computers. And I think with that, I'll thank you for your attention and take any final questions that uh, Olivia and folks you may have. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Thanks, Lako. I think that was really thorough and really great. And it's really exciting to see all of this, you know, come together. So the first question is actually just what you were talking about, which is sort of along the lines of, you know, why did you and the team decide to make this project open source in the first place? I guess, what is the thought and the strategy behind that? Yeah, that's, that is a very good question. Um, I think a few years ago, you know, quantum hardware has has um, maybe not enjoyed the same amount of open sourceness and, and openness. Um, 
But what I have noticed is that I'm really bad at predicting how far we'll get every year. And the good news is that it's usually because we get way further than I thought. And I think a large part of that is driven by this kind of exponential type of development and innovation in the field. And I, to me, and I think to, to a lot of folks here, a large driver of that is the openness in the community, is the sharing of ideas, is the, is the, the reason that you know, we don't need every single lab and in, institution out there to recreate the exact same tool. We can rather come together as a community stress tested together you know we can build in these methods with best practices by the experts uh with the help of the experts who designed them in the first place they can be experimentally tested and validated and verified you know i showed you several devices we designed with kit metal so we know those methods as implemented work on those devices and there's a focus on i think end-to-end -end automation as we get to larger complexities you know the uh, the designs of yesterday. The, the, the you know uh, this year's nature paper is a subroutine, and next year's you know PRL the kind of thing. Uh, the the rapid pace of innovation also means that the complexity of the things we're doing is increasing rapidly, and so I think there's a need to to help make life as easy as possible. And so initially, this was you know I had to do this design of this an analysis of this particular device here when I joined, and it was. You know, a bit slow and painful and, and laborious, and I just started automating it based on on this PyPR work I had done at Yale, and uh, you know, eventually Jay came, Jay Gambet came by and and saw this. You know, thanks to, also thanks to the encouragement of you know Dave and and Jerry and other people, and he said, why don't we take this to the next level and really help make this uh, something good for you know, not just internally but also help support the the community as a whole. And uh, I think the community building aspect is also quite key, kind of like the seminar series here. Um, it helps bring us a bit closer together and share ideas and exchange. Because at the end of the day, the main thing is, I think, to make sure as a community we move forward together. Anyway, that's my two cents. <laughs> no, I really like that. I like the idea of the community aspect and not just, you know, coming at it from a competition side of things. Yeah. Um, one quick question. So I think that it's very obvious from the from the last couple of graphs you showed that the participation ratio, that analysis is much more accurate than this lumped model that people had been using before. But some people in the chat were asking, you know, could you explain why for sort of a, a lay person? Why is it so much more accurate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just a good question. Um, um... Let me go back to that graph. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that, uh, you know, it kind of makes sense that when you want to design quantum systems, you should talk about energy because quantum is about energy. It's about quantized energy. Um, <laughs> that's a more heuristic thing. In terms of these graphs and why the LOM analysis, uh, I think, doesn't agree maybe quite as well as the EPR is two reasons. The first reason is just EPR uses the full glory of Maxwell's equations. So it's capturing a lot more of the detail of, of the fields and the charges and the spurious inductances and the spurious um, capacitances that you're not including in your lump model because the lump model is an approximation uh, that says my feature sizes are you know much more smaller than the wavelength and so I can kind of treat them as uh, first order response to Maxwell's equations and not have to worry about the distribution of the fields across the the, the shape. Uh, for our structures, they're they're pretty well in the lumped regime um but you know there's still a little bit more i think the other reason probably is um to do the lump model correctly is a little tricky because you have to make sure to include and that's what this 20 to 10 percent agreement is also about uh, one there's a lot of boundary conditions that you have to be careful about what you do is you're truncating your structure you're cutting your you're you're not taking the entire you know 20 something qubit chip and simulating it at once you're taking a subset of it that's the modularity but what do you do at the boundaries and what you do at the boundaries is pretty important especially at the boundary between a lumped element and a continuous mode a distributed mode such as the waveguides that we have and normally there are a lot of approximations made um but in our devices, we had very large couplings, and those couplings led to renormalizations of the modes that were non-perturbative. Um, so part of this paper kind of handles that in general. And the other part is that even if you take that into account, there's still some 
non-local features. Um, you know, Maxwell's equations are are effectively non-local. If they're local, they're local in their construction, but the couplings that they lead to are non-local, and uh, you you have to take into account a number of small dressings when you really want to get things precise. Like the chi, this looks like a big shift from twenty to ten percent, but that chi is you know ten to the minus three of the qubit energy. So you're talking at 10% of 10 to the minus three, you know, that's 10 to the minus five level in the Hamiltonian. Uh, so it's a pretty small shift and dressings and couplings due to neighboring couplers that load things down, that can end up impacting you at the 10 to the minus three, four, five level. Um, so maybe that's not a very straight answer because I think it's a series of, of effects that, that add up very quickly. <laughs> And uh, there's a whole other talk I can give you about this method, but maybe that we'll have to save that for another time. Yeah, I think we'll have to probably save that for another time um, because I think we need to wrap up here. One, <laughs> one last question is when are we going to be able to have a uh, summer school or a hackathon focused on Kiss Kitten Metal? <laughs> oh, wow. That is a great question. Um... Yeah, I don't think you know the answer to it. I don't know the answer to it, but <laughs> it remains a good question. <laughs> I, do, I don't know the answer. I think reach out to us on the Slack channel uh, or to any of these people uh, to more directly if you're interested in helping host that. I think, Olivia, maybe we should put our minds together and think of organizing one. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to have to get back to you on that, but I think it's yeah. a really good idea. Good and idea. there were obviously a lot of people in the chat today who were super enthusiastic about the topic. So uh, thank you again, Slacko. We had a really, really um, active chat today. And I think that was a really, really good summary of all the work that you and the team have been doing with Metal. Yeah, thank you, folks. Uh, yeah, it was a real pleasure. And uh, stay in touch. And uh, I guess, yeah, I'll leave you with this final slide. It's one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. And if you haven't already, remember to subscribe. We are back every week at the same time, 12 Eastern time for the latest seminar. Thank you.